I know from all the questions you type in the comments down below, that you all have trouble playing flush and straight draws. And to be fair, flush and straight draws are quite difficult to play. But if you play them correctly, they have the potential to be incredibly profitable hands, even though you will miss a decent chunk of the time. It's important to realize before we even get started that all flush draws and straight draws do not have the same value. For example, the best straight draw, even if it's a gut shot, is pretty good, whereas the worst gut shot is terrible. The nut low flush draw is usually pretty bad. The nut flush draw is usually pretty good. That's pretty good. Hopefully this is common sense, but it's very worth noting. All right, three things for playing flush draws more profitably we are gonna be discussing today is that you should be raising them far more often when the bet you are facing is small and far less often when the bet you are facing is big. You should also raise them far more often from out of position and far less often from in position. And you want to make a point to not raise with high equity draws that would have to fold to a re-raise, especially if a re-raise is a somewhat likely possibility. If your opponent's almost never gonna re-raise, well then raising them, raising them is probably fine. But if you're likely to get shoved on, as is the case when you're playing 40 big blinds deep in a tournament or in a three bet pot, when you're playing 100 big blind deep cash games, these draws very often want to call and not raise because if you raise, your opponents can then jam and then you have to fold out a hand that has 30, 35% equity and that's a disaster. So let's go through a bunch of examples. Now, all these examples are game theory optimal examples. If your opponents make some sort of blunder one way or the other, you need to account for that. But it's very important that you know how to play against someone who is playing well, and then the adjustments to take advantage of people who play poorly are often pretty logical. We discuss them thoroughly in PokerCoaching.com so that there is no confusion at all. Okay, raise more often against small bets is tip number one. Small bets typically indicate a, call it merged range, of hands that are medium strength. Typically, when someone raises and then continuation bets to flop, small, it often indicates either they're betting with everything, which includes a lot of marginal stuff, or hands that are not their best hands and not their draws, which will usually be hands like top pair, bad kicker, middle pair, under pairs, etc. Either way, against that range, you're going to want to raise decently often and put pressure on all of your opponent's marginal made hands. So we're going to go through a few examples to make this very clear. So 40 big blinds deep, the low jack raises, which is under the gun if we were playing six-handed, in a tournament, and you call in the big blind with all of these hands that are not gray. The grayed out hands are three bet pre-flop if they're good or folded down here if they are bad. Flop comes, eight of spades, four of hearts, two of spades. You check and the low jack bets 1.5 big blinds. As we can see in this scenario, you should, you should be raising 22% of the time with something like jack eight and better. Most of the time, straight up for value. You're just check raising jack eight here and getting it in. Yes, you are going broke with the jack eight. And you're also going to be check raising with some additional eights that have some backdoor equity, like eight six for pair and straight draw. You're also going to be check raising with some gut shots, like seven six, seven five, six five. You're also going to be check raising a lot of flush draws, like king six of spades, king three of spades, king nine of spades, jack ten of spades, and then some real junkers, like jack of spades ten. Jack of spades, nine. Queen of spades, nine. Ace of spades, nine. Stuff like that. So when we're check raising here, we have our best hands that are almost always good and often vulnerable. Hands that are just happy enough to get in. But our draws are going to be some flush draws, some straight draws, and some really bad draws, like overcard with backdoor flush draw. Okay? So understand that in this scenario, we are using a mixed strategy with a lot of our draws. Like eight seven off or uh, eight six offsuit for it's not one eight six. What am I saying? I really don't want to see this eight on the flop for some reason. Seven six offsuit. It looks like we're check raising it about a third of the time or a fourth of the time. That means we're calling it the rest of the time. Now, if you want to develop an implementable strategy here, maybe you would check raise seven six every time and then check call seven five and six five every time. I think that's probably reasonable. You're going to find that playing every hand a specific way hundred percent of the time is nowhere near GTO but it's way easier to do. So maybe that's something you want to do. Maybe you want to check raise like every 
nine six suited, nine five suited of, of spades, ten six of spades, ten five of spades, jack six of spades, jack five of spades, then call the rest of these junky ones. That's probably fine. Again, whatever you decide to do, realize you do need to mix it up. And that's because when you check raise with all of your flush draws on the flop, well, when you don't check raise and then the turn's a spade, if your opponent has any idea of what you're doing, it's going to be clear to them that you have no flushes there. And if you have no flushes in your range, your opponent can blast off. Or say you do check raise all the spades and your opponent calls and turns a spade, they know that perhaps your range is heavily weighted towards spades. And then they can just drastically overfold because you have far too many flushes in your range. So you have to mix it up, especially from out of position. But whenever you're facing this small bet, you do raise a pretty good amount of the time. And in this scenario, 22%. What if instead the opponent used the GTO strategy, which does involve multiple bets, but this time, exact same scenario, except for now they're betting pot. When your opponent bets pot here, they should be far more polarized to the best hands that are almost always vulnerable, plus some draws, right? And this is going to mean that their range in this pot contains a lot more overpairs. And now you'll see because of that, we're raising far fewer eights. Notice against the small bet, we're raising a lot of eights, right? But against the big bet, we're raising only ace-8 and maybe king-8. And that's it, right? And then we're also raising far fewer draws. Notice now, the gut shots are just folding against the pot size bet a lot of the time. Notice 7-6 uh, is just folding. 6-5 is sticking around, but it's not loving it. 7-6, seven, 8-7, seven, same thing, sticking around. Or Gosh, I cannot. I do not know why I want to think there's not 8 on the board. 7-5 is folding, right? 6-5 uh, is a double gut shot, so it's obviously better than 7-6. And um, then you'll see fewer flush draws raising as well. Like we see here, 10-5 of spades, 10-6 of spades, 9-6 of spades, 9-5 of spades. These hands are just check calling. We do see some king high and queen high and ace high flush draws check raising. Notice we are not check raising with hands like king nine of spades. That's because if you check raise that and get jammed, you'd actually have to fold, and that would be a disaster. So you check call it. That goes back to point number three. We'll talk about that later. But as you see here, against this bigger bet, we're raising far less often for value, which means we should raise far less often as a bluff. And we're, the bluffs we're raising with are bluffs that can check raise and then either have an easy call off or have an easy fold, like ace of spades nine, for example. We see over here check raising and then folding. But instead of raising 22% of the time, as we do against a small bet, now we're raising only 6% of the time. Let's take a look at another example. 40 big blinds deep, low jack raises. We call big blind, ace, queen, seven. We check, they bet 1.5 big blinds. Okay. Notice again, we're raising 15% of the time. On ace-queen-7, though, we don't have a whole lot of logical draws. The only logical draws are king-jack and king-10, and those can actually win at the showdown sometimes. And if we check-raise and get jammed, it's actually an annoying spot, and we'd have to fold, and that's pretty bad. So instead of check-raising with those draws, we instead check-raise with different draws. So notice in this scenario, we have a decent amount of aces, right, that are almost always good. When the opponent bets small, 1.5 big blinds, that often indicates a marginal-ish range, like we said, and that means they're going to have bad aces and worse a lot of the time. So that allows us to check raise something like ace nine and better, ace eight and better a lot of the time and just get the money in. Notice we are not check raising the lower aces all that often. We're check raising the best aces way more often because those are way more likely to be good. Then we're check raising with some total junkers down here with backdoor flush draws. Six, five suited, five, four suited. That seems optimistic to me, but that's what GTO does. Notice they're check raising the pocket twos. This is something almost no one does, but you definitely should work that into your play. We discuss this thoroughly in the poker coaching homework. We do a homework question every single month, and you'll find very often on boards where you don't have a whole lot of logical draws, the small pairs are sometimes used as bluffs. Feels dirty. Also, in scenarios like this where there aren't a whole lot of logical draws, bottom pairs very often used as a bluff. And as we see here, that is definitely the case with a lot of the bottom pairs putting in the check raise. And when that is this the case, you're usually check raising the bottom pairs that have the most live kickers first. And which kicker is most likely to be live? Well, that's going to be a two. So we see if you have the seven two suited, you actually check raise this scenario a lot, basically every time. Most people don't do that. They just check call or check fold, and that's a mistake. They're leaving money on the table. But it's important to note here that draws may not be the draws that you're thinking of. I'm not sure a lot of you think of five, four of spades on the ace, queen, seven as a draw. But we see very clearly here it is, and it is check raising every time. Same thing with 6 5. And I think a lot of you don't think of bottom pair with the nut low kicker as a good draw to raise, but it is. And you need to get aggressive with these hands. And if you do check raise the 7 2 and they go all in on you, you fold. And that's fine. The nice thing about the 7 2, though, is that it's actually a pretty clean five out draw, 
right? You have two sevens and three twos. And if you get any of them, you're almost always good and you have pretty much the nuts. Now, obviously, it's not the super nuts. It's the effective nuts. You could lose. But if you make two pair, 40 big blinds deep, it's okay. What about if they bet bigger, though? If they bet bigger, let's say they pot it. Now, you raise only 5% of the time and all of these junkers start folding or calling. We see now you're raising far less often, almost entirely for value, right? There's this weird Jack-7 suited is putting in the raise. That's a, a bluff, but uh, all these others are kind of interesting. I think I would probably be a little bit more linear than this even. I may not check raise with hands like Ace-3 here at all ever and just be like Ace-Jack and Ace-10 only. Maybe put in another another bluff or two with something like, maybe put, put in the check raise with the King-10 offsuit every once in a while if you feel like it. But as you see here, you're not raising very often at all against the pot size bet. That's because when the opponent bets pot on this flop, their range should be incredibly strong, like aces, ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten type stuff. And against that range, you just don't get to mess around. So you see, against a small bet, you're raising 15% of the time. Against the big bet, you're raising five, which is almost never. All right, what about when you're out of position? From in position, you're going to realize your equity pretty well because if your opponent bets the flop and you call, on the turn, if they bet, you can just call again and try to get there or fold. And if they check, you can then either check it back and try to see the river for free, or you can bet the turn and then blast the river and try to get them to fold out all their marginal hands. Both those are great. From out of position, though, if you check call the flop, very often it's going to go check, check on the turn. And then if your opponent has any sort of medium strength hand on the river, they can just let it go check, check. And then you lose, whether you're nine high or you're 10 high or whatever it is. Or if you bet the river and they have any sort of medium strength hand, they can just call because they're in position closing the action. And that's great for them. So because of that, from in position, you realize your equity well, and from out of position, you will not. And because of that, you have to rely more heavily on fold equity, which means you need to be raising far more often from out of position. So 40 big blinds deep, low jack raises, you call big blind. Ace, seven, six. You check, they bet 1.5 big blinds. Against a small bet, we're gonna be raising a pretty good amount of the time. What are we raising with? Best top pairs and better. And a bunch of draws. Notice we're mixing it up with the draws. We see the 8, 5, 8, 4, 9, 5 raising. This 9, 4 is a fun one with backdoor flush draw again. Remember, you're check raising some good draws and some trash draws. 9, 4 is a pretty trash draw. Uh, 5, 4, 5, 3, and 4, 3 are raising a lot. Interesting to see 9, 8 not raising, and 9, 8, 10, 8, and 10, 9 not raising all that often. That's because you don't really want to raise these and have to fold to a shove, right? So you see these raising a little bit less often. And that's good to know. So the junkie draws here are going to be draws mainly with some sort of backdoor straight backdoor flush potential. So we see the 9-4 suited. We also see king-8, queen-8, jack-8, 10-8. Well, 10-8 is a gut shot, but king-8, queen-8, jack-8, king-9, queen-9, jack-9, backdoor flush draw raising sometimes. Perhaps also worth noting, king-8, queen-8, jack-8, king-9, queen-9, jack-9 with a backdoor flush draw. Don't fold. They call or raise every time here. I think a lot of people on the ace-high boards think that jack-9 is just terrible and they let it go. But facing that 1.5 big blind bet, you got to get in there. What if we're in position, though? Same scenario, except for now, the low jack raises, and we call on the button. So now we're in position. Now, the ranges here are totally different. And because of that, the opponent should be checking far more often from out of position. Because they're checking far more often from out of position, uh, their range when they bet usually should just be stronger, okay? So that alone should make us raise less often. From out of position, if you've studied the tournament or cash game masterclass at PokerCoaching.com, you know that both players' ranges have roughly the same amount of equity a lot of the time because the ranges kind of line up on top of each other. And because of that, the out of position player has to check more often, and when they do bet, they need to be polarized. So against a polarized range, a strong range, we should be raising less often to begin with, but also in position, we don't necessarily want to raise, make the pot big, and give the opponent the opportunity to shove all in because then that completely kills our positional advantage going to the turn in the river. So, same scenario, except for we're in position. Opponent bets 1.7. We raise only 8% of the time for all of those reasons I just outlined, right? And you see the draws are very rarely raising now because we're very ra rarely raising to begin with. Let's take a look at another scenario on 987. Lots of draws available now. Low jack raises, we call big blind, 987. We check, they bet 1.7 big blinds. Here we're also going to raise a lot. Take a look at the draws on 9-8-7. It's going to be a lot of 10s, probably a lot of 6s, right? So lots of random 10s, lots of random 6s. So king, ace-10, king-10, queen-10, 10, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, and lots of 6s, right? King-6, six, queen-6, six, jack-6, six, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which makes a lot of sense because we have a lot of very strong hands in this scenario. Notice we have the straights, we have lots of straights. We have 
two pairs, we have sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Notice we're not raising all the sets here, which is kind of interesting. I would have presumed we should probably fight even harder on this flop, but apparently not. Even still, though, we're raising 17% of the time, which is kind of a lot because we're out of position. In position, though, we're going to raise less often. Not too much less often here, but less often. And we're raising more often in this scenario just because we are going to have more of the straights and pair plus draw combinations here than the initial raiser because they probably don't have stuff like 8-6 suited and whatnot that, that makes two pairs. One more thing to be concerned with is that you should not raise fold high equity draws. This comes up all the time. I've already pointed out a few examples earlier in this video. You can go back and watch those. And that's because with draws that have decent equity, if you raise and then get shoved on and you have to fold, well, say you know you're going to win 28% of the time or something like that. You really don't want to fold if you're going to win 28% of the time because based on the pot odds, you may only need to win 33% or something. So it is a fold, but you're folding away a lot of equity. Folding away a lot of equity is usually a very, very, very bad result, which is why, especially when you're playing 40-ish big blinds deep in a tournament or 100 big blinds deep in a cash game in a three-bet pot, when you raise, you usually have either a very good draw that's going to raise and then call it off, a, well, usually a very good draw, a junky draw, like a bad gut shot, or just some really bad draw, like over card with backdoor flush draw or something. So let's take a look at this scenario. 40 big blinds deep, low jack raises, you call big blind. 6-3-2. This is very good for the big blind. You check big blind, low jack bets 3.5 big blinds. When they bet 3.5 big blinds, they're already announcing I'm pretty polarized. If you've studied at all, you know that on 6-3-2, you should not continuation bet all that often because look at how this board interacts with the big blind's range. The lo uh, low jack has almost none of these hands, whereas the big blind has lots of these hands. So because of that, you should not continuation bet too often. So knowing that, when the low jack does continuation bet, they're usually very polarized. Against a very polarized range, you know you shouldn't raise all that often. However, this is a spot where we should be raising a decent chunk of the time purely because the board nails our range. So what are we raising with? Obviously our good hands, but then let's look at the draws. We have 7-5 for a gut shot, pretty bad hand. 6-5 for pair and gut shot, 6-4 for pair and gut shot. These are actually perhaps better than you think because they always have some clean outs to the nuts. 5-4 is the nuts, 5's pair plus gut shot, 3's and 2's are the effective nuts. And then what else? 6-3-2 with a flush draw. So we are raising in this scenario with very few 5s and very few 4s. So why would we raise very few 5s and 4s here? Well, when the opponent bets 3.5 big blinds, if we want to raise to something like 9, they can easily rip it in for 38 total. And then we'd have to fold out the 5s and the 4s. If the opponent bets smaller, though, we would be raising far more often in this scenario because then they won't just rip it in for 38 all that often. So when we do raise here, we are raising mostly with, again, very high equity draws or pretty low equity draws. The high equity draws are going to be straight draws with flush draws. So all of these, or at least the majority of these that are raising, are straight draws plus flush draws. We're not raising with too many um, total gut shots. Uh, like the 7-5 here is going to have a spade with it, I presume. Although, to be fair, maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, and there are also check raising with some junkers down here, like the ace eight, ace of spades eight, and ace of spades seven, and uh, ace of spades, or queen of spades nine, queen, uh, king of spades nine, stuff like that. So when we do check raise, we either have very high equity draws that can easily call it off, or trashier draws that can easily fold. Notice in this scenario, we're not raising, though, with hands like um, ace five and ace four too often. These are, these are good examples where you don't really want to check raise the ace-5 ace offsuit too often because ace-high is sometimes good and the gut shot's usually good when you get there, right? Notice we're not check raising hands like king-queen of spades and king-jack of spades and king-ten of spades and ace-jack of spades. You really don't want to check raise with a hand like a flush draw and they get jammed on if you don't have additional equity that, uh, to improve. Because when you do get shoved on, you're getting kind of the right price to call, right? You have to call 30 into a pot that's going to be 80, which means you need to win, what, 40-ish percent of the time. And that's about how often you're going to win. So you're in this weird break-even spot. You don't want to be in break-even spots. So while you're happy to check-raise the ace four of spades, and the king four of spades, and the queen four of spades, and all these flush draw with gut shots, you are not happy to check-raise a lot of the best flush draws that have a decent amount of equity because you do not want to get jammed on. It's a very important point. Also, a lot of people make the mistake in the scenario of check raising all their flush draws, like I said earlier. And if you check raise all your flush draws, well, when you check raise and then the flush comes in, your opponent knows you're very flush heavy and they can just easily fold. And if you 
check raise none of them, as some other people do, well, also, then in that scenario, when the flush does come, they know you're going to have a whole lot of flushes, and that's also really, really bad if they have some idea of your strategy. So that's it. Three tips for playing flush and straight draws. Raise more often against small bets, raise more often from out of position, and do not raise high equity draws that have to fold to a re-raise when they have pretty good equity. Instead, you opt to just call. Hope you learned a little bit today. If you did, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button down below. If you want a whole lot more examples, situation tips like this, make sure you click the like and subscribe button and the notification bell because we have a lot of videos here on YouTube and we have a whole lot of concise, well put together courses at pokercoaching.com that will go a long way to making sure you understand all the thought process that go into playing these types of hands so that you can then figure out at the table in real time roughly what you should do with each hand in your range so that you make the best play in all possible scenarios. So check it out at pokercoaching.com. Good luck, have fun, and hope you win with all your draws.